Hi, I'm Rob. And I'm Rob. And this is Ask Rob and Rob. Welcome to Ask Rob and Rob, where we give answers to your burning property questions. Ed and Peter have done the honours this week. They've got a great couple of questions into us that we're going to be answering very shortly. First, though, we just need to give you a quick reminder of how you can send in that burning question of your own. You have two options. You can call in and leave us a voicemail. To do that, call 013 808 0035 or you can get your question in via our lovely sparkly website if you go to propertyhub.net forward slash ask. Once you get there, it's very simple. Follow the instructions, leave a message. And remember, with either method, if you mess it up, just go again. It doesn't matter. Of course, we'll play the best version. And that's what we've got today. The very best versions from our two lovely listeners. And first up, we've got Ed. Hi, Rob and Rob. My name is Ed. I'm interested in getting your thoughts regarding joint ventures. I understand the notion around them. And I've previously been purchasing a small portfolio of properties loosely following the buy refurbish, refinance model. I've got a number of people who have contacted me, friends and family, asking if I would be interested in working with them, if they were to provide the cash for a deposit and the refurbishment, if I would source the deal, manage everything through to completion and eventually getting the property rented out and managing that. My question is regarding how this would normally be structured, um, both from a legal point of view, but also for this to be beneficial to both myself and the investor. I know this is different on a case-by-case basis, but I'm looking for advice regarding a typical example. If I'm not putting in any of the money, but I'm doing all of the work, how would one perhaps structure that to make it beneficial to both parties? Would you say set up a specialist purpose vehicle and then look to receive a certain percentage of any profit that makes in return for all your work it's gone into finding a deal and managing it and so on or what sort of models would you typically follow any advice would be really helpful thank you ed thank you for the question nice position to be in people beating down your door to give you money so how can you make best use of it Well, there are lots of different ways to structure joint ventures, but I'd say that there are two common structures. So one is you just pay an interest rate in the same way as you'd pay your lender. So for the sake of argument, say someone gives you £50,000 to cover your deposit and the refurb that needs to be done on the property. And in return for that, you pay them 8% annual interest or whatever you agree. Just pluck that number out of the air. Depending on what you agree with them, you might pay them monthly if you've got the cash to do so, maybe from other properties that you own, or you might roll that all up until the point that you refinance and use some of the funds that you're withdrawing from the refinance to pay them back. Either way, it's a straight interest rate. So whatever the value of the property ends up being is immaterial. The reward is all yours, but then the risk is all yours as well because you need to pay them whatever happens. The other way of structuring joint ventures is some kind of profit share. So you'll often see this with flips. So you'll get two people going in on a flip together. They'll make £50,000 profit after selling it and deducting the purchase price and all the costs along the way. And they'll split that 50000 in whatever proportions they've agreed on. So in that situation, the risk is shared because no one's guaranteed anything. It all depends on how the deal performs. In your case, with what you're talking about with buy, refurb, refinance, to me, and I'm far from an expert in these things, it seems that the first option, paying a straight interest rate, would be the way to go. Because if you were giving them a share in the uplift of the value of the property, then that's not necessarily cash that you're going to have in your hand to pay them with. It could be an increase in the equity value of the property, but that's not a lot of good if you can't actually hand it over to them. You could, of course, continue to jointly own the property together and split the rental income and split the eventual end value of the property when you sell it in however many years. But that feels a bit messy to me. And you're not necessarily going to want to end up holding assets long term with someone where you might have different views about what to do with the property or different preferences about when to exit, things like that. So, Ed, I think the thing to keep in mind is that there is no standard way of doing this. It's all about whatever you agree, whatever makes sense for the two of you. It seems to be that the first one is the one that's likely to work in this situation. So hopefully that gives you something to be working with. You can go away and talk to the people who want to put money in, find out what they're looking to get out of it and what motivates them and use all that to put something together that works for everyone. So there you go, Ed. I hope you're very happy with that answer. Next up, we've got a question from Peter. 
Hi, Rob and Rob. My name's Pete. I'm from Worthing, just along the south coast. Just wanted to say thanks for the uh, Property Podcast. Been listening for probably about a year, and it's really caused me to go into action, which is great. I've got my first property completing at the end of this year, and that's something that I wanted to ask you a question about, or two questions, really. I bought the property at around 250, and it's increased in value by around 35 to 40 thousand since I first put my reservation down. And I was just wondering, am I able to use that increased value as part of my deposit from my buy to let mortgage? I'm buying it through a limited company, so I want to obviously try and leverage as much equity as possible in the deposit, but I don't know whether the the banks will take the purchase price or whether they'll take the real value. So it'd be great to get your advice on that. Um, And secondly, just regarding insurance, is there anything that I need to be considering? Obviously, it's my first property. Uh, through a limited company, are there any sort of landlord insurances or anything else that I I should really be looking at or considering um, on the way? So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks again. Keep up the great work. Peter, two questions, you cheeky so-and-so. Go on, we'll answer both. Okay, so for your first question, Peter, can you take advantage of the capital uplift in your property, even though you don't own it yet? Well, you would think, yeah, that makes sense. Of course, of course you can. But you can't, because sometimes in property... Things don't make sense. So when you buy your property, your mortgage will be assessed at the purchase price, not the value. And what's really interesting is when the valuer goes out, the chances are, and this nearly always happens, that they will value it at your purchase price, even though the comparables might be showing that your property is worth quite a bit more. Don't be disheartened. It's not that you've necessarily got your figures wrong. It's just that the valuer has been asked to assess it at the purchase price. And why would they take the risk of upvaluing your property? Because that just puts their necks on the line. And because valuers don't like putting their necks on the line, they don't. The good news is, you at some point soon will be able to take advantage of that capital uplift. You may even want to choose to refinance early to do so. So, for example, if you're going for a two-year product and the redemption penalties are minimal then you may take a view and go, well, you know what? I'll pay those and refinance sooner rather than later to take advantage of some of the capital uplift. Now, don't just do that for the sake of it. You you must have a good reason in mind for why you want to do that. And often you have to wait a minimum of six months as well because no new mortgage company will acknowledge that uplift in that period of time. But it is possible. So congrats on investing so wisely and getting an investment that's worth more than the purchase price. But you'll have to wait a little bit to take full advantage of it. For your question on insurance, well, you can pretty much get insured against absolutely anything and everything. And insurance companies will be happy to oblige you with those requests. But what's sensible? Well, you've mentioned landlord's insurance. And yes, a lot of investors will take out landlord's insurance, which can cover a variety of things. So make sure that you do compare different policies. They are not all created equal. You may find two insurance products both called landlord insurance, but they may cover you for slightly different things. So just double check on that. Beyond that, if it's an apartment, then you'll have buildings insurance probably covered within your service charges. If it's a a house, then you will need buildings insurance, although your mortgage provider will insist on that anyway. And beyond that, it's really up to you. They're what I would call the true essentials. You can consider insuring your appliances, like your boiler. You can also cover things like your washing machine as well. But this is all optional and it's up to you. So you've got the essential in builders insurance. You've got the popular in landlords insurance. And then you've got all the optional extras. So there you go, Pete. Both questions answered. And if you would like your question or questions answered, then do get involved. Jump on our website propertyhub.net forward slash ask. We'll be back on Thursday with the Property Podcast and of course back same time next week with Ask Rob and Rob. So until then, take care, have fun, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.